Hi, everyone. Welcome, uh, Next Big Idea Club members. I'm delighted uh, to be joined today by Rutger Bregman, author of Humankind, A Hopeful History. What a fascinating book. Uh, I had the good fortune of reading this book in the galleys uh, before it came out, and I was just I was just blown away. I have here assembled on my desk here at Pink Ink World Headquarters my notes from that book. And the book and the notes, the, the notes run, I think, 14 pages, 14 pages of notes on this book. So I've got a lot of questions for you, Rutger. Um, but let's uh, let me just start with, I think, the most obvious and salient question for the next big idea club, which is your book has a big idea. Tell us what that big idea is. OK, so the big idea is that deep down, most people are pretty decent. Deep That's down, it, most people are pretty decent. So you can say it in a few words. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, for, for a lot of us hearing that, mm -hmm. the, the immediate response is, "That's nice. That's a lovely sentiment. We appreciate your Dutch gentility here, mm -hmm. but that's not." Here's the word you're waiting for, Rutger. That's not realistic. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to redefine what it means to be a realist. So often we equate realism with pessimism or cynicism. What I'm trying to show in this book is that it's actually much more realistic, much more scientific to believe in the good of humanity or at least our potential for kindness and cooperation. And that even this could be our true superpower as a species. It might even be the reason why we conquered the globe and why you know other hominid species like the Neanderthals are gone. So... Yes, that's, that's the, one of the central things that I try to do in this book, is to redefine what it means to be a realist. Right. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a jarring idea in many ways for a lot of us, because so much of our, so many, so, so much of our social structures mm -hmm. are built on the opposite presumption. We have governments and police forces mm -hmm. designed to rein us in. We have contract law to prevent us from hoodwinking each each other. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found fascinating about this book is that if that underlying premise is wrong, then everything is up for grabs. Yes, um, exactly. Um, and, and so there's also this idea that if our underlying premise is wrong and we continue to abide by it, that we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, yes. So... People may think, oh, this guy's written a nice, warm, cuddly book about human kindness. Isn't that nice? Um, well, actually, it's a really dangerous book, I think. So be aware. What's dangerous about it? <laughs> well, if you really think it through, this idea, then it has some quite radical implications for how we organize our whole society. Because if you and I can actually trust each other, if we can trust most people around us, then maybe we don't need all that hierarchy and inequality, hmm. right? So I think that the prevailing ideology of those in power for centuries has been cynicism, right? Because cynicism is in the interest of those in power. If we cannot trust each other, then we need them. Then we need the monarchs and the CEOs and the queens and the princes and the managers, etc., etc. We need to be kept in check. Someone needs to control us so that we don't ever go at each other, so that we don't have some kind of war of all against all, right? Yeah. So, so I think a darker view of human nature has been used for a very long time as a way to legitimize power. So if you turn that around, then obviously, yeah, you can ask yourself the question, can't we just move to a much more democratic or genuinely egalitarian society? That is, that is, I think, one of the most important implications of uh, updating your view of human nature to a more realistic view. Now, this re w w I think it's a fascinating idea right there because in in the kind of th in the thesaurus that many of us have in our heads, mm -hmm. we think of cynicism as a synonym for realism. Yeah, and what and, and and you're forcing us to make that kind of change, saying, okay, let me tell you what's really realistic here. Yeah, and and. This is an extraordinarily multidisciplinary book. That's one of the things I, I, I really like about it. But a lot of your realism is based on uh, evolutionary science. Uh, tell us why, if you really get into the guts of evolutionary science, the, what is real in human nature is something different from what we suppose to be real in human nature. Mm 
One of the most important questions that scientists have been asking for a very long time is why us? So why did we conquer the globe? Why are we the ones who built pyramids and cathedrals and, and spaceships? Why not the Neanderthals? Why not the bonobos or the chimpanzees? You know, what makes us as a species so special? And for a long time, we like to believe that this must be some plan of God. Well, that's not exactly scientific. Then we like to believe, you know, after the Enlightenment, that we must be really smart, you know, that our capacity for rational thought is really what distinguishes us from the, from the animals. But then you look at, you know, some, some intelligence tests where, you know, human toddlers compete with pigs or bonobos or chimpanzees and then often actually the animals win you know people should keep yeah, them that's that a in very mind. distress that's a very distressing section for parents to read uh, yeah yeah and for people you know who, who eat meat as well you know <laughs> keep that in mind the next time you eat bacon is that actually the pig can win an intelligence test against your toddler of two years <laughs> old but i guess that's another book anyway so th it's not that we're so so smart it's not that we're so strong either um what really distinguishes us is that we have this extraordinary capacity to cooperate. Mm -hmm. So there's one evolutionary biologist, Brian Hare, who calls this survival of the friendliest, which means that for millennia, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and so had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. Because if you think about it, I mean, for 95% of our history, we were nomadic and togetherers. And we had to survive in a very tough environment in, in, during the Ice Age, for example. And back then, if you wanted to survive, well, possessions, collecting a lot of possessions, that wasn't very useful. You needed to collect a lot of friends because friends helped you through tough times. That was like the real capital you could amass in your life, having as many friends as possible. So that was an evolutionary advantage as well. And this is, I, th I think, what really distinguishes us and what... what What's our true superpower? And you know, the most amazing thing is that you can still see this in our bodies today. You know, if we look in the mirror, we can see, for example, that we have really unique, extraordinary eyes. You know, our eyes have tell white. Us, I mean, I appreciate the compliment that I have extraordinary uh -huh. eyes, but, but tell us. <laughs> te well, tell we us all have extraordinary eyes, Dan. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us more broadly about that, because that's yeah. something that, and when I, re I remember the, the few paragraphs where you talk about that, that's something that I'd actually never actually consider uh, about mm. the fact that the, the the mere fact that we have whites in our eyes is yeah. significant to your theory yeah. tell us about that well it was a big surprise for me as well one of the most striking things i discovered during the research but indeed we are the only of all the primates you know and there are 200 primate species in total but we're the only ones that have white around our irises and this is very important because it enables us to track each other's gazes, right? We can see what other people are looking at. Now, obviously that helps to establish trust. If you look at, you know, chimpanzees or bonobos, they've got sort of dark around their eyes and they're a little bit like poker players wearing shades. Now, imagine a society where everyone's wearing shades all the time. That mm -hmm. wouldn't be a society where it's easy to trust strangers, right? Uh, I mean, there's a reason why poker players wear, are wearing shades. They don't want, they don't want you to see what they're thinking. Um, but we give away our gaze to everyone. And, and the same is true for this other unique thing that I started to do at the beginning of our conversations when you were saying such nice things about me. You know, it's uh, our unique ability to blush, right? So oh. blushing is a really unique phenomenon. There's some evidence that maybe a, a couple of parrot species might be able to do as well. But mm. apart from that, you know, among all mammals, among all primates, we are the only ones who blush. And again, if you think about it, that is, that is so fascinating that we involuntarily give away our feelings to someone else. And again, probably the reason why we do that is that it helps to establish trust. It's easier to, you know, to make friends with someone who actually has some, I don't know, modesty and has the ability to blush. Um, so, yeah, you can still see this uh, survival of the friendliest. You can still see it in your own body today. Tell us about the difference between wild animals and domesticated animals and why you and I and our fellow human beings are, in a very large sense, a very deep down sense, domesticated apes. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting new theories from evolutionary biology. Yeah. So we all know what domestication is, right? You've got sheep, you've got goats, you've got cows. And what we've done to them is that basically for a very long time, we've selected for tameness and for friendliness. 
-huh. So, yeah, domestication is a little bit like you start with a wolf and you end up with a chihuahua after a very long process. <laughs> you know, I, I always think that someone should have, you know, it was a big mistake of, of the first wolf who ever, you know, became friends with a human, you know, don't do it. You'll end up like a chihuahua. But anyway, um, that is what domestication is. And, <laughs> and biologists have long known, Darwin already uh, knew this, is that domestication, you know, tends to do certain things. Uh, there's a long list of traits that are associated right. with domestication. So thinner bones, smaller brains, uh, uh, white uh, spots in the, in the fur, uh, right. floppy ears and that we yeah. also know now what genes are associated with domestication and and the most important thing that happens during domestication is that animals just start looking a bit more childish right yeah. like puppyish it's the puppification of a species uh, it's as if they never really want to grow up anymore and then you look at those list of traits you look at the genes that are associated with it and you look at us and you're like wow but humans they, they clearly have been domesticated. There's such powerful evidence for that. But then the question is, who did it, right? Who domesticated us? It's, it's not like the cows have domesticated us, right? Or the Neanderthals. So the answer is that we self-domesticated. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the name of the theory, self-domestication. Um, this is what happened. And now we have very powerful archaeological evidence for it. You really see, you know, if you compare... Uh, skeletons that have been excavated, you know, from 50,000 years ago and 30,000 years ago, 20, 10,000 years ago, etc. You really see that the shape of our bodies is changing and we become more puppyish and more feminine. And um, yeah, that is that is basically uh, what has happened. And I th also think actually it's the secret of our success. Yeah. Now, what, one of the things that's interesting when we bring evolutionary theory into a conversation is that I think, we, I mean, when I talk about that, I always do it with a little bit of skittishness for, mm -hmm. for, for two reasons. One, I, um, it, it's very easy to get reductive and explain everything mm -hmm. in terms of evolutionary theory. But the other side of it is that there is a somewhat uh, nasty history of evolutionary arguments being deployed for nefarious ends. Did you encounter that at all when you were working on humankind? Yes, absolutely. So you need to be quite modest and, how do you say this, um, careful when you make these kind of arguments because it's just very, very hard to know how people lived 20 or 30,000 years ago. And you really need to look at all the pieces of evidence that we have. And you're right, I really tried to make this a multidisciplinary book. So I look at the evidence we have from anthropology, you know, anthropologists who've for a very long time studied nomadic and together tribes around the globe. And they obviously have huge cultural differences, but then there are also really striking similarities. If you look, look for example, at the culture of play among nomadic and togetherers, you know, whether they're, they're living in the north of Alaska or in the Kalahari Desert in Namibia. Um, it's really interesting that they often give a huge amount of freedom to their kids. You know, many Western parents would be absolutely shocked if yeah. they would see how much freedom these kids get. Um, so there are striking similarities. You can obviously also look at the archaeology. You can look at cave paintings that have been found and excavations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I mean, in my book, I say this as well. It's, I try to build a case, but then still... You know, at the end of it, I'm saying, I mean, we're not sure yet. This is a, the debate that will be going on for decades. But the evidence that we do have really points in a more hopeful direction than what many people believe. You know, it's not yeah. the case that we were in some kind of war of all against all in the Stone Age. Actually, the evidence points in a completely different direction. Right, right. Now, let's let's take this notion. So we're looking at human beings forged in this certain, but based on the, the imperatives of evolution, that is pushing us to be friendlier, to mm. be more cooperative, to be more social, uh, to some extent to be more generous. Uh, now, let's take that nature as it's formed in evolution and let's transport it to the, to the moment. And, and when I say the moment, I mean this particular moment that we're in, mm. this bizarre historic moment that, that we're in right now. Uh, what are your thoughts generally on how individuals, societies, and governments are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? Hmm. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see a, a battle at all between that old notion of realism, what is realistic, hmm. and also your approach, which is more 
would you would you would you argue I think very convincingly is the actual more accurate account of human hmm. nature? Hmm. You know, I start the book with a story of what happened in 1939, 1940, when elites in Britain in the UK were really worried that once the bombs, the German bombs, would start falling on London and other British cities, that people would just panic, go nuts, that they would start plundering, looting, that the veneer of th civilization is very thin and that, you know, as soon as we end up in a crisis, that people start to behave in a really horrible way and that, you know, the army couldn't even start fighting because they would have their hands full controlling their own population. Now, what happened is pretty much the opposite. So there was sort of a spirit of keep calm and carry on that dawned over Britain and, you know, people posted really funny and dry uh, signs uh, in front of their shops, like uh, more open than usual, you know, after they'd been bombed, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so the experts were completely wrong, including Churchill, who also assumed the worst in his own citizens. Uh, and then the question in 1942 was, what are we going to do with our own, you know, fleet of bombers? And interestingly, the British and the American experts at that point believed that, you know, the spirit of a nation could still be broken, but that the British were just a special case. You know, they've mm. got this wonderful dry humor. They've got the stiff upper lip, but e they could easily, you know, bomb the Germans and kill, kill their spirit because they're, they have a much weaker moral character. So that's what they did. They dropped 10 times as many bombs on Germany as on the UK, and it was a total disaster because the same thing happened again. Actually, they later found that the cities that were bombed the heaviest actually saw increased production compared to the cities that were not bombed as heavy, right? So actually there was more resilience. Uh, so elites, when they think about human nature, they often look in the mirror and they assume that other people are like them, you know? But even though it's true that power corrupts, I mean, power is a very dangerous drug, most Absolutely. people are pretty decent. And that is, I think, I mean, this is a long story, I know, but this is really what I saw happening, especially in the first couple of months of, of the COVID crisis, is that again, elites underestimated the resilience of ordinary people. And um, it was actually they themselves who in many ways failed and uh, did not meet up to their responsibilities. Uh, in the UK, you had the situation with Dominic Cummings, right? Breaking the rules, the advisor of uh, Boris Johnson. And now in the U.S., you have the situation where, you know, the, the people at the top are calling for the establishment of law and order, while actually much of the violence comes from them. So this is sort of the irony that you see so many times in history. Well, you say early in the book, which, again, was written pre, pre COVID, you have a, mm. you, you say explicitly catastrophes bring out the best in people. That's your reading of the evidence. Mm. Do you think that the COVID catastrophe has brought out the best in people? I think that the real headline, the big headline of the COVID crisis is there's been an explosion of cooperation. You know, if you just zoom out a little bit, what you see yeah. is billions of people quite radically changing their lifestyle to stop the virus from spreading further. You know, I don't think it has ever happened on a skill like this in all of world history that so many people so quickly change the way they live their lives. And and often, you know, not, not just to protect themselves, but but to protect, you know, strangers and or the vulnerable elderly. And um, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's 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 early to say. And, you know, I'm a historian. Mm -hmm. I always like to wait for like at least 10 years before I give my comments on a situation. Right. But right. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if actually uh, what we uh, that, that sociologists will later find that uh, actually people became more resilient during this time. Yeah. Yeah, I think about your. I, I've thought about your book sometimes, Rutger, uh, when I've been walking around my neighborhood here in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. So I've been quarantined here in my house. Um, I, I have not been many places, believe me. And mm -hmm. but I will go out and I will wear a mask and I'll maybe go out for a walk or on an errand with my wife and we'll both be wearing masks. And I look outside and I realize that at least here in Washington D.C., the vast majority of people are wearing masks. Uh, hmm. Certainly, when they go into stores, they are wearing masks. The vast majority of people are actually st sheltering in place. Mm -hmm. the, there are legions of first responders who are stepping up and serving others. Mm -hmm. And we have this set of rules that are that they're not even rules so much. This sort of set of guidelines, set of suggestions 
mm-hmm. that most people are complying with. And when I walk around my neighborhood, I don't see military police enforcing the mask rule. Mm-hmm. I don't see you know, military police coming in and making sure that the pink family is staying inside. <laughs> I, I really do think that the remarkable thing about COVID is it really speaks to your argument, which is that the vast majority of people are doing the right thing yeah. In it without the threat, without that kind of Hobbesian threat of force yeah. uh, to control them all the time. They're doing it in more, they're doing it in more um, sort of self-directed uh, Rousseauian kinds of, of, yeah. of ways. And yeah. I, and I, and I think that's hard to see in the moment, but you know, it, the historians of 50 years from now, 20, hundred years from now might look back on that and say, wow, the people, many of the people, especially here in the United States, not everybody, but many of the people here in the United States were akin to those British citizens that you were just that you were just talking about. Now let's let's shift that a little bit uh, and talk about um, you know the other thing that's exploding, especially in the United States, but all over the world, hmm. uh, inspired by the horrific death of George Floyd, which is all of these racial uh, the protests over racial equality. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me what you make of of that in light of the theory that you've put forth in your book, Humankind. Hmm. So it's actually interesting because I was thinking this as well when you were talking about masks is that obviously there are quite a few people especially in the US who are not wearing masks yeah and it's easy you know as someone who's maybe progressive or on the left side of the political spectrum to look at that and, and think these people are selfish you know why are they not wearing masks why are they not protecting our communities but I don't think we should see it as selfishness I think it's actually uh, a form of groupish behavior and maybe mm. what you can call tribal behavior mm-hmm. where sort of wearing a mask has become something that a certain group does. So Democrats wear masks while Republicans or, you know, fans of Trump, they don't wear masks because, and that's not necessarily because uh, of selfishness, but often because of loyalty or of comradeship or because of, you know, you have stronger feelings for your own group. And this is really the big paradox at the heart of my book is that on the one hand, I argue that we have evolved to be friendly, but on the other hand, this friendliness, this our yearning for connection with other people is often exactly the problem. We we very often do the most horrible things, actually, in the name of comradeship and of friendship and of loyalty. Um, Uh, Expand on that. Expand on that a little bit, because because I I do uh, one of the one of the things that sort of changed my view over the last few years, it, you know, sort of being indoctrinated on this idea that human beings are inherently selfish mm-hmm. and coming around to what I think is a more accurate belief based on your work, based on, say, John Height's work, work et cetera, mm. that humans are not selfish, but groupish. Mm. Um, and so this this need to affiliate and cooperate isn't necessarily embracing the entire world. It's there's actually it's, yeah, it's, it's often more about embracing our own in-group. Yeah, I do have. A bit of a more nuanced take here, I think. So indeed, okay. we have this capacity for groupishness. We have a tribal button in our brain, but it doesn't have to be this way. And we also have a really great capacity actually to connect with strangers or with people who are not for our, for, from our own group, especially if we can meet each other. So right. we have been designed for face-to-face interaction. In the Stone Age, there was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was no television. We could see each other. We could see each other blush. We could look at each other in the eye, etc. And we now know from uh, some really interesting anthropological evidence that probably the networks, the social networks of hunter-gatherers were quite large. So they didn't just live in these small groups of hunters and gatherers, but actually, um, you know, could meet over a thousand people uh, over their lifetimes, which also, I mean, that must have basically been the case because how could we ever have conquered the globe if we didn't meet a lot of people to learn from, right? Individually, human beings are not that special, but collectively, we've got a huge collective brain. So um, this is this is important to keep in mind. Yeah, there's the tendency in the in the American debate now to say that oh, the human brain is sort of hardwired to always think in groupishness and tribalism and blah blah blah. I think that we shouldn't overplay that and overemphasize that. Actually, and, there are, and, and, and to be fair, I mean, to be fair for, for, for the readers of your book, I mean, you do you do talk about that. You talk about the work of Gordon Allport mm. and the um, and the, the contact hypothesis, which is yes. that if we are exposed to other people who aren't like us, those kinds of tribal differences will often will often uh, melt away. Yeah. So so there's so, 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 uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, there's maybe one because you asked about the quick killing of George Floyd and yeah. there's obviously much more happening there. 
What's interesting is that actually psychologists have known for quite a long time that we humans are actually, we find it quite hard to be violent. It's, uh, it's very different if you compare it to sex or food or eating, right? Our, our bodies understand very well that sex is good for us, right? We like it, we get a psychological reward for it, and uh, there's a clear evolutionary reason we would go extinct if we wouldn't make babies anymore. So um, with violence, it's quite different. If you have a soldier, you draft a soldier into the army and you send him to Vietnam, for example, and the soldier kills an enemy combatant, then often the soldier combat comes back traumatized with mm. PTSD. So that is very strange, right? We don't become traumatized after we've eaten lunch or, or after we had sex, right? Or most of the time we don't. But then often when people kill someone else, they kill something inside themselves as well. Interesting. Point, which yeah. suggests to me that even though we're capable of it, um, we're not sort of hardwired to do it. And indeed, if you look at the psychology and history of violence, then what you often see is that distance plays an extraordinary yes. important role, both Physical distance, so a lot of the casualties in all the wars of history were actually caused by artillery because it's easier to just push a button and have an explosion far away, uh, but also psychological distance. And this is really what you see in that horrible, horrible video in which George Floyd was murdered. You see dehumanization at work. And this is another terrible truth about our species is that we do have this capacity to dehumanize other people, that we look at people and we don't see people anymore. We see inferior creatures or cockroaches or whatever. I'm, I just want to emphasize that this is not something that quickly happens. There's often a long, highly complex historical process behind it or, you know, a really an institution that is just rotten to the core. Uh, and I think that must have been the case in, in uh, you know, uh, if you look at think about George Floyd, you know, that's it's not as if you can just take an average healthy student from an American university and quickly turn him into a killer. You know, that, that doesn't happen. So there's a long history and a long... Uh, you really have to look at what has happened, you know, to our institution, to policing in the U.S., to prisons in the U.S. What has happened to the whole criminal justice system in the past couple of decades so that people have, have been, uh, are now able to behave in such a way? Uh, because it's very counter, uh, counter to their, I would say, their true nature. Yeah. So, so let's let's shift gears a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. another thing I really like about this book, um, I mean, you did a great job of, of laying out the the big ideas and what it all means and and how you know what what we deem as realistic isn't necessarily realistic, isn't accurate, um, and that if we actually read the uh, evolutionary record and apply it to how things are going right now, we can have a different view. Uh, but on a, on a more specific level, uh, I, I think part of this, like, I, I want you to start a business called the Bregman debunking unit, <laughs> because so much of the book is, debunks things that I think educated Westerners mm. take for granted. Um, and I want to go through some of these because I mm. think it's really revealing. Um, let's start with uh, The Lord of the Flies. Now, I'm an American. I read Lord of the Flies when I was in middle school. Basically, every American student reads Mer Lord of the Flies in middle school. Mm -hmm. And we learn that this is not just a chilling scary story that this has a broader message uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh it's it's un, it's revealing a truth about human nature mm -hmm. that left to our own devices we are going to be cruel and inhuman and um race to the bottom in one of the most fascinating sections of the book uh you you uncover through some some good detective work a real life example of the Lord of the Flies. Um, tell us what happened and how that story unfolded. Hmm. So, you know, when I was 16 or 17 years old, I also read Lord of the Flies. And I remember feeling quite depressed and cynical afterwards. But I also remember thinking, huh, well, that's probably what kids are really like. Oh, right? yeah. No more Harry Potter for me. From now on, I just want to read <laughs> realistic literature. And it was only years later while I was doing my research for this book. And, you know, in many ways, it's been a reckoning with my own ideas. I used to believe in many of the things that I'm debunking in this book. Um, 
But so I wanted to have another look at Lord of the Flies, and I wondered whether it has ever happened, whether there's ever been a case of kids shipwrecking on an island, and I was just so curious if I could find something. And after a very long time on, uh, you know, Googling and newspaper archives and you name it, I did find one example, is that indeed, supposedly in 1966, uh, six kids were rescued from an island uh, near Tonga, which is an island group in the Pacific Ocean, after they'd been living on the island for 15 months. You know, it's pretty So, so pretty this, is, this, is a, this is a great find. This is yeah. an actual Lord of the Flies scenario playing out in real life. So it's exactly. a group of boys you know, shipwrecked on an island, forced to, to, to try to survive. Yeah, and it happened. So it, it happened in 1965. They were rescued in 1966, according to the newspaper article that I found. And so I wondered, maybe they're still alive. You know, it's 50 years later now, but back then they were around 15 years old. Maybe, you know, I can track them down. And I was really lucky because I was about to go on a book tour for my previous book, Utopia for Realists, uh, to Australia. So I said to my publisher, you know, I need a, I need a week off because I think this uh, might be the story of a lifetime that, <laughs> you know, that uh, I might be able to uh, find as a writer. And indeed, I, I managed to track down the captain. His name is Peter Warner, who rescued the six kids in 1966. Or well, maybe rescue is not really the right word because they could have, you know, managed to live there for years if they would want to. Um, and I also managed to find one of the original Lord of the Flies children. His name is Mano. He was 15 back then and now around 70 years old. And together, Peter and Mano, they told me what had happened back then. Interestingly, actually, Peter and Mano are the best of friends today. You know, they still go out sailing um, regularly. And I discovered that in almost every single way, the real Lord of the Flies is the opposite of the fictional Lord of the Flies. If this would be some Hollywood movie, people would say, oh, that's so sentimental. This is so unrealistic. Kids would never behave like that. <laughs> but the thing is, it's the real Lord of the Flies. <laughs> And, and, and to, but to tell us what happened when they so they so these boys disappear. Mm -hmm. They the, their parent they, they basically skip school one yeah. afternoon. They yeah. they get in a boat. Uh, not generally a good idea for a group of young teenagers. <laughs> no. They find themselves on an island, unable to get back. Uh, then somebody discovers them, as you say, fifteen months later. But what was the, describe what their lives were like on that island? It, it wasn't the case of. You know, Piggy and whatever the other characters yeah, were, Ralph, and yes. Lord of the Flies. You know, mm -hmm. um, brutalizing each other. It mm -hmm. was the exact opposite. I mean, what did it give, set the scene? What did it look like there? Well, they worked in teams, so uh, teams of two: two to be on the lookout for ships, two to tend to the garden, and two to cook. Uh, sometimes they they ended up in fights. I mean, that happens. They're teenagers. They're humans, like like all of us. Uh, but then what they would do is that one would go to one side of the island, the other would go to the other side of the island, they would cool off a little bit, come back and say sorry. Uh, they made a lot of music, they uh, made their own uh, guitar from, you know, some of the uh, driftwood from the from the ship. Uh, they had their own gym with curious uh -huh. body weights, <laughs> they had a badminton court, Um yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't tough for them. You know, they had really tough times. At one point, actually, one of the boys broke a leg, but they managed to heal that with traditional medicine. So, yeah, when this Captain Peter Warner found them uh, in 1966, he found six boys that were in perfect health. And um, they, co yeah. they cooperated with each other. They took care of each other. They had, yeah. I mean, the thing that amazed me, Rucker, was that they had like, a, 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 you know, like a meal schedule. Mm -hmm. That they would, uh, you know, who's going to cook and what are they going to make? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was yeah, just, yeah. It's kind of extraordinary. Yeah, um, yeah. Left to their own devices on an abandoned island, this small group of, of, of teenage boys stepped up and survived in as noble and heartwarming a way as you could possibly imagine. And that is the real story. Yeah, exactly. And so if millions of kids around the globe still have to read Lord of the Flies in school, which is fine. I think I think it's still a good novel. I mean, it won the Nobel Prize for a reason. But then let's please also tell them about the one time that we yeah. know of that yeah. real kids shipwrecked on a real island, because that's a very different kind of story. Okay, so let's march through another 
project from the uh, Bregman debunking unit, which um, <laughs> is another, which is a staple of, of let's say this, this is, uh, this is more of a staple of uh, sociology and anthropology classes, mm. which is what happened on Easter Island. Mm. So tell us the what we think happened, and then tell us what really happened. Yeah. So. I've written about this, you know, the standard story of Easter Island as well. It was really made famous by Jared Diamond in his book yeah. Collapse. That's really, I still think it's a really great book. So the standard story says that here you have this island that is incredibly remote, you know, the most remote place in the whole world, basically, uh, where in the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century, Dutch explorers discovered this lost civilization that was basically already dying when they found it. They, they did see these extraordinary statues. We've all seen them, you know, the so-called Moai, huge mm-hmm, statues mm-hmm. and heads, etc. They, they found a population that was, you know, hungry, that was poor, and that was clearly not able to actually create these statues. So the, the question was, how, who made these things and how did they do it? And, and the story that became very popular is that they had committed eco-suicide. That at one time, there was a huge forest on the island, there were a lot of trees, but then they became so obsessed with building all these statues that they had to cut all the trees to transport uh, the statues and to erect them. Um, that at, 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 at some time, you know, all the, sta- the trees were gone. The soil started to erode and um, uh, agriculture production went down and people became really hungry. And so then they started dying of hunger. A civil war broke out. They became cannibals. And so when the first European explorers arrived, they discovered a civilization that was basically already dying that is the standard story of easter island that i must admit i used to believe as well but what's the real story (laughs) so what's interesting is that in the past i'd say 10 to 15 years there's a new generation of archaeologists who's taken another look at the evidence and this is really like a a detective it's like a, a a true crime story where you have to look at all the pieces of evidence right you have to look at the skeletons that have been excavated you have to uh, look at you know the oral traditions, the stories that people have been telling for a very long time, and now a very different story has emerged. Actually, the, there are very few signs of violence in the archaeological record, so very few signs of, of weapons. Before a very long time, we believed that so-called mata'a, which is sort of ni- knives, were being used to for, by these people to slaughter each other. Now, uh, archaeologists think that these were actually, you know, these weren't really ma- weapons, but more like kitchen knives. Um, Mm. you know, used to if you want to eat a banana or something like that. Um, And so, most importantly, they've actually discovered that agriculture production went up and there was no civil war and there there were not thousands of people who've been killed by other people because the population probably has always been small, only around 2,000, 3,000 people at max. So, yeah, all these supposed killers have a pretty great alibi. They never existed. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's really extraordinary that the real story of Easter Island, according to the recent evidence, is not a story of a civilization killing itself, but a story of hope. Now, why is this important? Because Easter Island has been used for a very long time as a metaphor for our own exactly. future, you know? Easter Island, they, these people, they were alone on an island. They didn't have ships to take them away. We are al- alone on this planet. We don't have rocket ships to all start living on Mars. So often Easter Island is used as a metaphor for what we are doing to our own planet, you know, with climate change and the extinction of species. Now, I am incredibly worried about both of these things, but I do worry that sometimes environmental activists or, you know, thinkers and writers can become too cynic, uh, too cynical, and, and that they start describing our species as a plague or, or, you know, some kind of virus that is just destroying everything. Um, and then they underestimate the resilience we also have. We, we are really good at letting problems grow on an exponential scale, but solutions can grow on an exponential scale as well. And um, if you look at the past five years, and uh, you, if you look at both the political and the technological progress in the fight against climate change, I, I'm not saying you have to be an optimist, but mm. there are good reasons to be hopeful. So I, I want to sp- spend a couple more um minutes on this debunking unit because okay so you, you've destroyed my junior high english class hmm. you've destroyed my college anthropology class hmm. now uh, the thing that you really blew up was my freshman year university introductory psychology class because hmm. that class when i took it 
a while ago was the uh, sort of a greatest hits of mm. psychological research. So mm. we learned all about human nature in that in that research. And of course, we learned that if you take people and put them in a basement and assign some of them to be prison guards and some of them to be prisoners, mm -hmm. that in a snap of a finger, they will assume their roles in the most brutal way possible. And mm -hmm. I'm talking, of course, about the Stanford prison experiments, which has been a staple of introductory psychology courses for really 40 years, mm -hmm. except it's not true, yeah. as you say. Tell us there, about that. There are some really big problems. And I think that the problems with the Stanford prison experiment are so big that actually we need to remove it from, from the textbooks. Um, we now know based on the evidence from the archives, because this is what has happened, you know, the archives have opened up and we, we can now take a look behind the scenes of these really famous social psychology experiments from the 60s and the 70s. And we now know that Philip Zimbardo, the psychologist who, who did this study, um, he and his co-researchers, they specifically instructed these students to behave like monsters and to be as sadistic as possible. Some of them were not, you know, trying hard enough and they were pushed, you know, do better, try harder. Why? Because Zimbardo wanted specific results and he set this, or one of his researchers set this to the participants. Is that because some of the participants said, you know, I don't want to abuse these, these prisoners. That's not who I am. Let's just sit and play cards or something like that, drink tea together. Um, but then they said, no, you got to do this because we need these results because then we can go to the press and say, look, prisons are horrible environments. We need to reform the whole thing. And so that's what happened. Very quickly after the experiment had ended, Zimbardo went to the press and it became one of the most famous studies in all psychology. You know, for 50 years, millions and millions of students around the globe have heard about the Stanford prison experiment. Um, and it is, you know, it's not science, to be honest. It's really yeah. not science. It um, it's essentially bogus, but it, but it, but I, I think one reason it survived is that it adhered to that that kind of falsely realistic notion of human behavior. Exactly, Again, that left which is the, a very left old the, idea. In, in left Western to their le yeah. left to their own device. I mean, in your view, deep down, people are pretty decent. The realist view is deep down, people are horrible monsters, yeah. and so this is proof of that. So you also, so we also learned in that freshman introductory psychology class. We also learned about Stanley Milgram's experiments where yeah. people will just resolutely in response to authority zap other people with painful uh, electric shocks. And you yes. say that famous study is not accurate. Yeah. I still think it's useful. So there, are, it's a better experiment, I'd say, than the Stanford prison experiment. And M Milgram really discovered something quite extraordinary and, and disturbing as well. But you, sort of the initial claim was that 65 percent 65 percent of people are willing to go all the way so give random strangers they don't really know but have you know just quickly met uh, a shock of 450 volt which is lethal right. dangerous um right. you know and, even... and in, in the experience in the experiment the people who were supposedly on the receiving end of these massive electric shocks mm -hmm. the, the 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 participants in the experiment could hear them Saying, you know, yelling, Scream saying, shout, oh, stop, yeah. stop, yeah. you're hurting me. Yeah, well, and in reality, obviously, these were just recordings. But it seemed that at least that was the claim that many of the participants thought they were in a real situation. Again, the archives have opened up. And we now know that actually uh, many of them didn't believe it. You know, they thought it was a fake situation anyway. And if you think about it, it is a bit strange, right? Do you really believe that if you sign up for an experiment at Yale University that you're going to kill someone else in a basement? I mean, it's, it is understandable why people had their doubts. And indeed, if you look at those people who doubted whether the situation was real, it was exactly those people who are willing to go, were willing to go further because they were like, you know, it's fake anyway, so I can just keep pushing this button. Um, Milgram himself really doubted the scientific validity of the study. You know, at one mm -hmm. point he confided to his diary that he said something like, you know, is this, uh, is this real science or is it just theater? You know, is it just good for television? The difference, though, with the Milgram experiments is that they've been replicated, often with similar results. I mean, there are problems with the replications. And the other thing is that uh, 
even if it's not 65%, even it's, if it's say like 50 or 40 or 30 or 20%, it's still way too high, right? You would expect that only psychopaths would do something like that or sociopaths. So we need sort of a new interpretation of what actually happened here. Milgram believed that this was some kind of automatic robotic behavior that people just mm. plugged out and were just following orders, like many Nazis said after the Second World War. But there's now a new generation of psychologists who see something very different happening here, which is sort of followership behavior, is that people identify with the researcher. They want to help him with his scientific project because they believe in science. And um, yeah, then they start doing these horrible things in the name of friendship and loyalty. Uh, they just they just want to help. And meanwhile, they do horrible things. And this, I mean, this is obviously the old saying, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um and this is uh, something that I come back to quite often in the book, is that, yes, we've evolved to be friendly, but don't just start celebrating just yet, because often it's uh, it's the problem as well. Right. Now, uh, let me ask some, some so again, what, one of the things that we've, we've learned is that there is an appetite for these darker kinds of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that the, that, and if you see it in, in contemporary media as well, this fixation on on blood and violence and, mm-hmm. and conflict, do you think that's connected to how media are financed? Hmm. And that's a great question. Do you think there's a way to alter those incentives so that they so that they report on more instances of kindness, generosity, and compassion? So let's first make a distinction between the news and journalism. I think that like good okay. independent journalism is incredibly important. So please, especially right now, subscribe to an important publication uh, that you know tries to protect our democracy. It's it's really important to to keep those in power in check, to speak truth to power. But then the news is is something different. The news is mostly about exceptions, about things that go wrong, uh, and it tends to be about sensational things, about incidents. And I think that the news is actually not very helpful. It, it's more like a drug that tends to poison the conversation or poisons our, our democracies. Um, psychologists uh, term this um, mean world syndrome. They, they've all long known that people who follow a lot of the news, which most of us actually do, around 90% of the population is addicted to the news and follow it on a daily basis. But you just get the impression that people can't really be trusted and things are going downhill. Um, journalism is or at least good constructive journalism helps you to zoom out a little bit and so it helps you to focus on the you know the really important structural forces that govern our lives sometimes for the good sometimes for the better so you'll learn that on the one hand we've made extraordinary progress in the past couple of decades we are richer and healthier than ever you know and in the fight against child mortality or diseases we've made a lot of progress but then on the other hand there are real big things to worry about as well such as climate change now the question about financing is interesting because um, if you, for example, compare, you know, the Netherlands where we have more public financing of journalism mm-hmm. to the US and, and the UK where it's more commercial financing of journalism, I think that the public model, you know, often results in better, more nuanced journalism. I think that's that's true because you don't have to go for the clicks all the time. You don't have to, you're not reliant on advertisers, etc., etc. But then still... You know, often you end up with the same problems because actually you still want to have the clicks because you're, I mean, still your superior is going to judge you on that. I'm very excited about a new movement in journalism, which is, as I already mentioned, uh, constructive journalism. Constructive journalism is not the same as positive news. It's not like, mm-hmm. oh, yesterday a panda was born in the zoo. You know, uh-huh. it's not, <laughs> that, that's silly, I think. Constructive journalism is about focusing on the structural forces that govern our lives, and then also talking about the solutions to our problem and following those people who are working on the on the problem, right? Uh, and coming up with new and interesting ideas. I guess that's um, what I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like another key takeaway from, from the book is that we need to find a better way to distribute higher quality information. Mm. Uh, we also have this problem with like low quality information circulating. Um, did um, is, is there a way that we can get, you know, what's a way that we can get more real, like truer ideas circulating? I know that's a tough question, Rutger, mm. Rutger but 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 um, 
Is there is there something that we can do to get more of these higher quality ideas circulating? Mm. Because I mean, I, I do think there is a phenomenon in the information ecosystem mm -hmm. that bad is always stronger than good. Yes. Um, and so, is there is there a way for good to fight back? So it's it's hard. I recognize that. I mean, yeah. why do we? so often believe that most people are selfish, even though there's such powerful evidence that we're really not. Well, I've already talked about the news industry. I talked about this very deep idea within Western culture, you know, the veneer theory that our civilization is only a thin veneer that goes back all the way to the Asian Greeks, a very old idea. I talked about, you know, why this is in the interest of those in power, right? Cynicism is their prevailing ideology and it has been for yeah. a very long time. But then finally, you also have to recognize that it's also within ourselves. Psychologists call this the negativity bias. Right. The truth is, is that evil is stronger than good. You know, I, I can't make it any better. Evil is more powerful than good. But, and this is the good news, the good is in the majority. There's so much more good out mm -hmm. there than evil. So... This is the, what, what you see again and again. If you think, for example, about how you top on autocratic regime, you know, how, what kind of protest is more, more successful? For a long time, researchers thought that violent protest is more successful. But then they started doing the math and building this database. And Erica Chenoweth is a sociologist who did this research. She actually found that actually, you know, um, peaceful protest movements are like, two or three times more effective. And why? Well, the reason is they draw in a lot more people, on average about 11 times more. And that makes sense if you think about it, right? You, you do not only draw in like, like young men with too much testosterone, but men, women, rich, poor, young, old, right? They all come together in this massive protest movement. And I think actually that's what's been happening in the past uh, couple of weeks in the US, you know, the, one of the biggest protests in, in, in all of American history. And um, I think it's one of the reasons to be uh, to be hopeful uh, in this moment. Um, so yes, on the one hand, evil is stronger, but good can win when it's in the majority with an overwhelming force. That is uh, right. That is the mechanism right. I, that you see again and again. I also I also think just talking to you now, it's it's not explicit in, it's not explicit in the book, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's implicit. And you brought a little bit to the surface just now with your your concept of constructive journalism. Mm -hmm. Is that you know. Um, uh, constructiveness is more ultimately more powerful than destructiveness, mm. but destructiveness has a kind of short-term potency mm. that gets our attention, whereas yes. constructiveness requires more effort. You don't see immediate results. It requires more cooperation and so forth, but it's ultimately more powerful. Let me ask you a few more questions before we mm. wrap up here. I want to come back to this idea of, again, and, and I, I can't emphasize enough to the people watching, how multidisciplinary this book is. You range over so many different bodies of evidence and bodies of knowledge. And I'm wondering, and I know you're trained as a historian, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering whether this, um, this notion of realism, this very constricted notion of realism, whether you think it's connected at all to what we've seen, especially in the last 40 years in the academy, which is hyper specialization mm, that mm. people know not only their domain, but their, the, the, you know, the minutia of their, the subdomain of their subdomain. And they mm. are the world's leading expert in that kind of, in, in that kind of micro domain. Mm. Do you think that, that, that scholars today are sometimes too lost in the weeds to see the entire uh, picture? And that could be contributing mm. to this, mm. the, the prevailing view of this mm. false realism? I love that question. So when I was a student, uh, and this is, uh, what is it, 10, 11 years ago, uh, I went to the US and I studied at UCLA. And I studied with a professor and a historian named Russell Jacoby. And one of his most famous books is called The Lost Intellectuals. I think he published it at the end of the 80s. And in that book, he was lamenting the decline of the intellectual, by which he meant sort of the kind of people who indeed have a more multidisciplinary approach, and also, you know, really participate in the public debate with their knowledge. And he also, you know, lamented the hyper specialization already back then at the end of the 80s. Now, obviously, right. you know, this is much more the case today than it was back then. And, and so when I was a student, I thought, you know, I want to I do something in a different way. 
And interestingly, Jacobi already back then, he had an institutional expla explanation for why the intellectuals are gone. He said, you know, you, you just can't earn a living as an intellectual anymore. Back then, you know, in the 50s for the New York Times, if you wrote a review for a book, you could, you know, earn a month's rent. That's not possible anymore. So you have to be either at a university or you have to become a journalist following the news. Now, I have just been incredibly lucky. So when I was 24 years old and I just finished studying history, I got a job at a place called The Correspondent. It's a journalism platform that had just been founded in the Netherlands. And they said, you know, we're going to practice constru constructive journalism here. You have to write one essay a month, do whatever you want, you know, write about whatever you want. So for the past seven years, I've had this life where for five months I could go deep in anthropology and then for five months deep in archaeology and then the history of Easter Island for three months, etc., etc. So I think people are, you know, a product of their institutions, right? And I just had this extraordinary pr privilege to be working on this project for the past uh, five, six years. And then indeed you start seeing things that otherwise you wouldn't see. I think it's not because I'm, I don't know, so special, because I'm, but I've just... You know, there was one thing. This was one of the most e exciting moments during my research when I really realized that I wanted to write this book. I was talking to Marie Lindegaard, who's a psychologist doing research on the bystander effect. You know, that's a one, another one of those things. that I, uh, from We learned about Kitty part. Genovese also <laughs> yeah. in the that first year course. Yeah, exactly. So the bystander effect is about how do people behave when there's an emergency? Someone's drowning, someone's attacked in the street. The standard story from psychologists for a long time was people don't help because we're, you know, we're lazy or we're apathetic or whatever. There's something wrong with us. Um, She's done the research and actually proved based on real life evidence from CCTV footage that actually in 90% of all cases, people do help. So don't believe the lab experiments, believe what real people do in real life based on this most powerful evidence that you can get, right? Footage from cameras. Now, um, I was talking with her, I just done the interview and I was blown away by her. And, and, and then um, I told her about another uh, book that I had just read from Franz de Waal, you know, the great Dutch mm -hmm. primatologist, primatologist who's, that who's written about empathy, etc. And I told her about his view on his views on human nature. And then she said, oh, my God. So it's happening there as well. Right. So she didn't realize that it was wasn't only happening in psychology, this move to a more hopeful view of human nature, but it was also happening in biology and evolutionary anthropology and archaeology and sociology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then I knew what my job was going to be. I would just have to connect the dots and to show that something bigger is going on here. Yeah. Draw, toward the end of the book, you, 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 you sketch a vision of what the uh, 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 what uh, government and the political economy might look like. Give us a, give us a, a quick description of that. Hmm. So what you assume in other people is what you get out of them. Our view of human nature tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And for a very long time, our institutions have been designed around the notion of selfishness. Then you get schools with a quite hierarchical system where you sort of try to push knowledge into people's brains, uh, into the brains of kids. Um, you get workplaces that are quite hierarchical as well, where managers decide what, what needs to be done and you don't really rely on the intrinsic motivation of employees. Um, and uh, yeah, the same is true for prisons, right? Prisons, you, do, uh, you really don't believe in the goodness of, of your prisoners. So yeah, you get these warehouses where they don't have the ability to do anything or develop themselves. If you turn this around, you get completely different institutions. You get schools where kids get much more freedom to explore, to create, to play. You get workplaces with much less hierarchy, where you work with self-directed teams, where you really rely on the intrinsic motivation. People do their work because they believe in their work, because they want to contribute. Um, and one of the most radical examples in the book is uh, uh, the Norwegian prison system, where they even do this with prisoners. So, um, you know, Norwegian prisons, the, the inmates get the freedom to socialize with the guards. It's, it's to, remarkable. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. And, 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 and to make music and, and uh, it works, you know, it has the lowest recidivism rate. In, in the whole world, the Norwegian criminal justice system, the lowest chance that someone will commit another crime once he or she gets out of prison. It's pretty much the opposite of the way things are done in the US. Um, so that's what I mean when I said at the beginning of our conversation, 
that this is a revolutionary idea. It has really radical implications for how we organize our society. Yeah. And there's a particular policy you're fond of, uh, which we've heard a lot about in the United States, really in the last year, which is a universal basic income. Now, it makes intuitive mm-hmm. sense that someone having a few extra dollars in their pocket would, would like that. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but you think, again, that it's actually more, to use your word, more radical, more transformative. Explain that. Yeah. My previous book, Utopia for Realists, one of the main ideas in there was universal basic income. I wrote it in 2014 when it was... I think not a very famous idea. Not, not at uh, all. And yeah, it was a quite obscure idea. Now it's become much more famous, mainly thanks to Andrew Yang and his presidential <laughs> campaign. Um, and um, what I experienced while I was promoting the book and talking about it with readers is that people were interested in the scientific evidence because there have been many experiments with basic income where you know if you give people money, poor people money, turns out it's a great medicine. You know the. the Poverty is not a lack of character, it's a lack of cash, as I like to say. Um, healthcare costs go down, crime goes down, kids do much better in school, people find new jobs, they start new companies, etc., etc. Um, so they were interested in the scientific evidence, but every single time, you know, when I was discussing that, that book with readers, that at some point after 30 or 40 minutes, someone would say, yeah, but what about human nature? You mm. know, isn't it true that in the end, people are just selfish? And, you know, lazy and they'll, you know, maybe this will work on a local scale on, on, on this particular place in this particular country at that particular moment in time. But, you, you know, in the U.S. this will never work in the world. This will never work because human nature. And then I started to realize that I had to dig a little bit deeper uh, to show that actually uh, it is entirely logical that universal basic income works because it's built on a realistic understanding of who people are. You know, what kind of creatures we are. So uh, I want to end by addressing the risks of cynicism and despair in the face of huge and complex problems. So you Mm -hmm. talking about the climate crisis, you write and I'm going to quote from the book right now. My fear is that their cynicism can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, a nocebo that paralyzes us with despair while temperatures climb unabated. The climate movement, too could use a new realism. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Well, let's first say that cynicism is a gift to those in power. You know, it's really what they want you to be. Because people who are cynics, they're just easier to rule. They don't really rise and revolt. They don't, you know, go against the oppression or the hierarchy or the racism or whatever. So hope is very dangerous to those in power. And that's why I think, not optimism, but hope is something of a moral duty. Hope impels you to act. Hope is about the possibility of change, about the possibility of building a different kind of world. And actually, I think that's what history is also about. It's why I think that history is the most subversive of all the social sciences. (laughs) You know, it just shows you that things can be different. And that there's nothing inevitable about the way we structured our society right now. This is also interesting, actually, about studying American history. If you think about all these really exciting ideas, like, you know, the prisons from Norway or basic income, these are originally quite American ideas, actually. So in the 60s, it was the Americans, you know, who first experimented with these kind of revolutionary prisons. And at the beginning of the 70s, it was Richard Nixon, of all people, who almost implemented a modest basic income in the US. So there's a real tradition here to reconnect with. Now, why I think this is important is because we're now in a moment of time in in, in history where, I don't know, it seems as in a way we're dancing on top of a volcano. On the one hand, we've made extraordinary progress, right? We are richer, wealthier, and healthier than ever. But then if you look at the challenges that lie ahead, if you look at the kind of mobilization that we need in order to face the climate crisis, it is so much more than people, most people realize. You know, I I often think that people on the right are often naive about climate science, right? They, they tend to think that, Oh, the science is not trustworthy. Well, I'm afraid it is. Um, and people on the left, they tend to be naive about climate action. You know, they tend to underestimate just how much needs to be done. If you really want to halve emissions in 2030 and move to a, zero carbon economy in 2050. We need to do something that's never been done before during peacetime in all of world history. So 
You know, I've said this in the past. If you're a moderate right now, like a little bit of a centrist in the middle, I, I mean, I love moderates and centrists and I love reasonableness and I love nuance, <laughs> but it's simply not realistic uh -huh. to be that right now because just the, simply the changes that this time is calling for are so radical. Um, and um, what gives me hope is that there's a new generation of often younger people who realize that, who really realize that. And if you look at the past 10 years, We've seen some incredible change. We've seen ideas that used to be dismissed as unreasonable and unrealistic. We've seen them moving into the mainstream. Higher taxes on the rich, universal basic income, a Green New Deal, you name it. All these ideas, you know, were seen as quite unrealistic and are t taken seriously. So that gives me hope. And, and we need that. We need hope. And as you say very compellingly, hope is a moral duty. The book is Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman. It is the quintessential big idea. Uh, Rutger, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Dan.